Hi, I'm Rick Cram. You know that sense of wonder or amazement when you meet someone who's got a story? You'll experience that now as we listen to Judith Bowman. She's president and founder of Protocol Consultants International, a prominent business protocol expert, corporate speaker, educator, and renowned authority in the field of professional presence. I invite you to listen for those golden nuggets in Judith's story and perspectives, which are worth taking to heart as you plan to be your best as you navigate change. Judith, thank you so much for joining us today. It's wonderful to have you here. It is my pleasure and my honor, and thank you for extending to your wonderful invitation. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. Let me first start by asking you, you started um, your protocol organization back in 1993, was it? Yes, very good, thank you. What was, what was the genesis behind that? What led you to choose the career path that you have? So thank you for asking. <laughs> the um, I never really thought I had a story. Um, I guess I do have a story. And uh, basically we were brought up a family of five in a rather strict environment. Um, it was definitely family hour. And uh, because my father who came from very humble roots, who became a successful real estate developer, uh, was out and about among judges and lawyers and bankers. and. Uh, he wanted, so he learned very quickly the difference and nuances that were very important to people's skills, etc. He wanted to make sure that all of us grew up being very comfortable and feeling uh, natural in the same sort of ilk as we would get out into the world. And so it was always, you know, gentlemen stand and make eye contact and serrated edges in and, and all of that. So it was ingrained in all of us. And so I uh, graduated from BC and uh, was out and about in the world of, of sales, of intangibles. I sold things like travel, corporate travel and sign up award programs. I sold hotel space um, and uh, booth space for Sheldon Adelson. In fact, I say my claim to fame is helping Sheldon Adelson, who I believe is still the wealthiest man in the world, uh, build his empire. And so I did, I sold a lot of booth space for Sheldon Adelson. Uh, as I was out and about with uh, people that I was selling to, I was frequently entertaining and uh, offering lunch to CEOs. And I would sit across the table from a CEO from XYZ company, and I would notice what I call the banjo grip, you know, with a sort of a hearty way to hold a fork and knife. And I thought to myself, they're not holding a fork and knife properly. This is the CEO of ABC company and they have forgotten how to hold a fork and knife. And I thought maybe they weren't ever told and no one's born knowing anything, right? Yes, and true. so I thought the number one rule of sales, identify the need. I thought, mm hmm there's a need. And so to teach, to remind, to reinforce. And I thought to myself silently at the time, one day I will provide this you know, fill the gap, provide a need. So uh, after my son was born, many years later, I had the chance to, I had, was lucky, I had um, a nanny and I had a, could work out of my home and uh, I started the Etiquette School of Boston because one-on-one -on -one with anyone, I was fearless. However, with any groups, I was petrified. And so I thought I'll start with the children, make all my mistakes and, uh, and so I did. So I, I started with the children, uh, teens and young adults. Uh, about seven months into uh, this business, this is the Etiquette School of Boston, uh, at the Colonnade Hotel with David Colella, my friend who was the general manager at the time, uh, unbeknownst to me was a young adult who was a reporter who ended up writing a story that landed on the front page of one of our local Boston papers that headlined, I've got it up here on my wall, woman makes living teaching manners to children and a couple of really fun things happened uh one the paper sold out uh i received a call from uh three fortune 500 ceos themselves basically saying can you do for a seasoned executives that which you do for the children and uh cbs nbc cbs sent in a film crew from new york and we filmed our first, uh, my first corporate class live on national television at Wentworth Institute. So yeah. I never went back after that. It was corporate, corporate, corporate. But you know, if anyone says to you, Rick, can you do? You don't say no, you're like, okay. And you kind of figure it out. I said, sure. So they asked me to get together a mock class of 50 
again, we filmed at Wentworth and I was very relieved when that first class was over with <laughs> and uh, went on to work with Corporate America, uh, executives at all levels and um, yes. There are two things that strike me through that wonderful story. One is how things change uh, and you just wonderfully describe the sequence of events in, in your life and how one thing led to the next and some wonderful things happened along the way. And you used a phrase earlier on that um, many things are learned and that we're not born with knowledge about even such things as manners and so forth. And so as we're going to be talking about change and how to plan to be our best as we navigate change, at what point would you say you started learning a perspective towards change in general? Well, I realized that I had to adapt and I wasn't ready again, but I, I knew I needed to adapt to this new demand. There was a wonderful uh, demand in my business now to go corporate. So you just sort of do it, right? I mean, you just, if, again, if someone says to you, what can you do? You don't say no, it's just you do it. And so I, um, I stepped up my game and I, um, uh, actually, there was certification, more certification involved, and which I now provide, and uh, very happily. And so it's you know it's a process. I think this whole life journey is is obviously it's a process. I have made every single mistake that I list in both my books that I have in all of my programs, and I say to my students, seminar participants, please learn from my mistakes. And you know things like asking a very senior executive for their business card, done it. Missing a chair because I haven't, you know, the one, two, three step this, done it. Uh, just embarrass myself by asking inappropriate or ill-informed questions, done it. So preparation, of course, is key. Dressed inappropriately, on and on and on. Every single faux pas and mistake, I've done it. And so uh, that's how we, we all learn, right? So I try and save people from the embarrassment and humiliation that I myself have gone through. And I, you know, it's in the book. Please learn from my mistakes. <laughs> each mistake, each failure, so-called, those are learning opportunities. Absolutely. Growing yes. opportunities. Right. That, that's, that's wonderful. Yes, um, thank you. Certainly, here we are talking in the midst of fairly early still in this COVID-19 um, situation. And I keep hearing two words over and over, which somewhat reflect some of what you're uh, sharing with us. And that is how uh, those two words are uh, adapt and adopt. Uh, we need to go with the flow, bend, learn through all this. Just curious, at this point of the, the game, as we're sheltered in, in place and so forth, anything that you've particularly learned or that you might be sharing with others to help them navigate this? So thank you again for that question, Rick. So uh, a couple things, actually. Um, I remember reading in uh, college a book by Kubler Ross. Uh, the topic was on death and dying, and I learned quickly that there are seven stages. And you know, so there's there's denial, and there's you know there are these phases that we all go through to, and the final is acceptance. And I believe that, you know, the sooner we all accept the fact that we're all in this together and we're all kind of trying to muddle our way through and adjust to the new normal and doing things like this, a lot more Zooming and a lot more masking and, <laughs> you know, having some fun with it too. But just accepting that this is a time, there's a silver, I believe there's a silver lining in everything and every seemingly tragic uh, uh, situation there is uh, is a silver lining and I see so many people we all do coming together and helping each other and reaching out and just really I think um, remaining positive a positive attitude is is key yeah. and uh, right and and doing all of the things you know I am a woman of faith very strong faith and uh, I believe that that's uh, definitely getting me through and I know a lot of other people but uh, taking care of our, ourselves, our bodies, our minds, and resting and eating well and vitamins and probiotics and lots of zinc for sure. And you know, all the things that everyone's doing, but staying positive and really maintaining that positive attitude and spreading that to help others too, maybe it doesn't come as easily too. Um, so it's, it's really important. You mentioned accepting and actually accept is the, um, 
third leadership strategy in the leadership strategy framework of plan to be your best as you navigate change. And a lot of people often think, well, accept is in, we have to accept and embrace change. But you honed in on the very point that I like to, to drill into there, and that is we need to accept on one hand, different people have different perspectives when experiencing change, but we need to, and especially if we're working with teams, we need to all get to the same perspective if we're going to truly be a, a team that, that works and thrives. So thank you so much for that. A lot of people don't hone right in on that. Oh, I will. Thank you for saying that. But it, it is true. I believe that I just, the sooner we all come to terms with the reality and just accept it and go with it, we can be joyful and we can be, we can be productive and stop complaining and have, I love the, the humor that's going around. The people that think of these great jokes, you know, we've got to laugh at it too, you know, pouring the wine into the pancake mix or whatever the, the crazy things are and uh but it's you know we really see americans rise to the occasion and people shine and um through the worst of times and we are at war with this virus and uh, I really, you know, I just see the best in people. I really do. And if someone even starts to hint at complaining or that, stay, stay positive, no negativity, you know. So, and it's not what we say, it's how we say it. And this is also, I believe, giving us, uh, giving us a terrific opportunity to really hone in on the very core values and tenets of that which we have professed uh, to forever. So things like meeting protocol and boardroom etiquette and, and um, all the body language and facial expressions and eye contact and things in your backdrop and, and people noticing and attire have come to the fore in these times of Zoom and, and, and uh, being so visible one-on-one. -on -one. So watching, you know, things like posture and hands. What are you doing with your hands? Are they on the table or in your lap? Are you over gesturing or then your face? Do you look bored? Do you look, and so people are putting these into a new spin. It's like, this is what we've been speaking to and professing forever and for decades. And I'm thrilled that there's a huge heightened awareness of the importance of how we're coming across because guess what? People notice. We are all judging people, whether it's conscious or subconscious, we are all assessment machines, right? Yes. And, mm. and so, you know, the first thing you notice is my backdrop, is my attire, right? If, if I'm looking pleasant and approachable or not. And again, these are subconscious perhaps, but excuse me, it's so important. And I'm thrilled that there, again, is a, this opportunity to create a huge awareness uh, of, how, of, of tennis that we've always espoused to. The, with, as I'm listening to you, I'm listening to someone who seems to be very prepared for change. Uh, and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you is because I believe what you're doing helps people be their best. But let me ask you, is there a certain intentional approach you have to how you prepare yourself or perhaps even prepare others to navigate change? So uh, preparation is just is so essential in life, right? I mean, if uh, just being mentally prepared, I remember just, and I love just by answering your question, uh, if I may share a, a story. Please do. Um, thank you. But um, so when I started, uh, I was fortunate to have um, the people at New England Cable News embrace our message. Mike Nikitas, the senior anchor there for years, was a a good friend and really embraced our important message about people skills. And uh, we would go over the program and a five minute topic, maybe spend an hour on it every week in preparation for the following week's topic. And I remember never feeling really comfortable talking about the topic because I was like, how's my hair? Is my makeup this? Is this straight? Is this? And I, and I remember someone saying to me, Judy, it's not about you. It's about your message. So, and that was a light. It was like, oh my gosh. It's, you know, when we focus on, when you own your material, when you own it, it's all about your message. It's not about us. We're just the messenger, right? 
So, you know, I ha just, I hope that that, so preparation is huge and Excellent. being confident in your, in your subject matter and knowing what you want to convey, knowing that you've got a certain amount of time to do it in um, and, uh, and conveying it in a way that's really engaging, that people buy into it because that's our goal, right? Is to adapt to every audience. Every exactly. audience is different. And so it's difficult in these days to assess the audience. We can't really read the body language as we would perhaps like to, but, but as much as we can. So assessing the audience and just being really confident in your subject matter is huge. Yeah, it truly is, it truly is. Any, are there any analogies as you, that you've thought about from your past, whether it was months ago or years ago, now that we're dealing with a significant change and everybody's participating in ex this experience, any particular stories that you could share that have uh, a sense of how you've navigated change or helped others? Perhaps there's a certain challenge. What might have been your solutions and what might have been the outcome? Okay, well, thank you again for that um, question. So the first thing that comes to mind was actually nothing that I did. It was what, something that a client did, who was a friend, did for me. So by way of answering that, and that was, um, that was back in uh, 2008 during our economic debacle, mm -hmm. and everyone was sort of free falling. And uh, this client friend, friend who is a client, called me and said, Judy, get the book blue ocean strategy which by the way still applies today i don't know have you read that right? i haven't read it i've heard of it okay great so so blue ocean strategy just if would you like a just a quick snippet please do yes yeah. uh, thank you so um it tells of when for example the circus the very first circus came to town and i'll call it the apple circus and the apple circus came to town and it had um, and it had a merry-go-round, and it had a clown, and it had a Ferris wheel, and um, and people said, in cotton candy, and people said, oh, this circus is great, we want to go, and so they paid. So if something is good, something is well received, there enters competition. So enters uh, Barnum and Bailey, I think is another, and so Barnum and Bailey had the clown, it had the Ferris wheel, it had the cotton candy, but they had they added lions and tigers and bears and a trans peas and and caramel apples. And so and so the competition just appropriated itself. And so as the competition procreated itself, the prices forced down. So everyone is kind of doing the same thing, offering more, prices down, and no one's really making any money, really. And then there are issues with animal cruelty and all the rest. So what to do about family entertainment? Enter Blue Ocean Strategy, a form of family entertainment at an altogether different price point, Cirque du Soleil. Are you familiar with Cirque du Soleil? Yes. Where they actually show the four seasons on stage. They'll go from an ice, from ice skating to, uh, to Saudi Arabia and the desert, you know, but, but the four seasons all in the same venue on stage and now it's not a $12 price point or even a $24 price point it's an $84 price point but people paid it because it's entertainment and it was unique and there was value and so that was so when my so I closed the book and I said what can I do to you know, along the same lines, to provide value and quality in our message and change the price points. And so this was back then, we came up with what they call now micro learning. At the time we called them our little five minute video clips, but micro learning, which is so huge today. And uh, we did that back then. So we converted, so if we give a, uh, if it takes us, let's say 20 or 30 minutes in one seminar to cover something like networking, we can do it in five minutes. So you want this five minute, you're going to a networking event, Rick, here's five minutes, let's hit the video, let's hit the link, and this is five minutes, everything you need to know about what to do, preparation, uh, during, etc. And so uh, that's what we did. Oh, ter terrific, terrific. <laughs> how, how did it work out? What, what so, was the outcome? 
Okay, so uh, we we actually, I was heavily invested in that. I am heavily invested in that. And we did a few 20 minute videos. We did dining, we did executive presence, and we still have it for sale on our, on our website. And in fact, I've uh, partnered with someone who um, is going to be distributing uh, these to, you know, en, en masse, if you will. Mm -hmm. So it's all good. So it's all, but it's, you know, that's taken a while to for, to catch on because that was way before its time. So it's, good. good things take time and, and you're responding to, to a need. That's, that's wonderful. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. The, uh, and actually, you, you, it's funny how you made me uh, think about with the Cirque du Soleil story. They, they're such a great example, aren't they, of the three pillars of what a good brand needs to have or even a good message. It's got to have the credibility, the relevance, but that point of differentiation. Which, which makes it stand out and made it possible for them to uh, charge more of a premium price for their services. Absolutely, Rick, as you say that, interestingly, did you know that uh, there was a woman who wrote a book, she lives in Hollywood, Florida, the name of the book escapes me, and, uh, but it, it underscores the fact that 98% of CEOs in this country are not able to articulate what distinguishes them from their nearest competitors. Wow. So if CEOs can't do it, how do they expect their frontline salespeople to articulate how they distinguish themselves, right? Yes. So yes. That is something that I, I'll always bring to a company. Uh, we're talking about networking. It's like, okay, have your tagline prepared, preparation is key, questions, etc. Ask the person with whom you're speaking, how do you distinguish yourself from your nearest competitors? And yeah. and usually it's it's a very interesting question. It's very compelling, just as a follow-up to your comment. It's basically uh, it's a question that I and team members have asked and continue to ask when we're starting an engagement with companies that need to wrestle with how to create a plan for moving forward. Case in point, there is a bank in Massachusetts that had a division struggling. It was flat growth for a long period of time. So we started doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with the executive management on down to mid-level management. And we started each interview with that question, what is this division? How would you describe it? No two answers were the same. Each one of them different. And that is the primary symptom of when there is an identity problem and, and the challenge to articulate what is that unique quality about this. Mm -hmm. so, so for anyone who might be, uh, if you're watching this and wondering about, uh, does my organization have such an identity problem, do exactly that. Ask everyone you can, what is this organization? And raise a red flag if you're getting a different answer to everyone that you're putting that question to. But that, that, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. That, that it's key. And I'm finding, and maybe you've seen the one, one or two videos I've put out so far, uh, a challenging time, especially such as we're doing, shakes a sense of identity for organizations, teams, as well as even individuals. Yes, um, and to that point, and as a follow-up to what we just spoke of, um, knowing your company's mission statement is something that most people don't know. Mission statement, value statement, uh, it, it, it's so basic. And it's interesting because it's something that we'll start every program with, because usually those who engage our services uh, have goals and mission statements which are consistent in terms of respect and integrity and people skills and advancing relationships. And so um, it's interesting to know how many companies have really rethought that and rewritten it in a more thoughtful way. And, and it, it really is, is such a good practice to have it's almost a necessity to have uh, people in the organization know what that mission statement and what the company values are and, and to brag about those because, to, you know, to be aligned with an organization whose values are consistent with your own, which is probably why you were hired, uh, is, uh, is a very smart practice. So true. So, and so well said, you, you sound like someone who is a planner. Can you describe for us what kind of a planner you are? So, you know, I, I think that has evolved. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, I've always uh, been, but I, I think when you, you know, between my company and my foundation, the National Civility Foundation, and, you know, everyone's time is so precious. I think we're all being becoming much more aware of planning and making the optimum use of our time and life work balance is, is real. It's a challenge for all of us. Uh, as a woman, as a mother, having my son and being a single mother for so many years was uh, was so challenging and trying not to let that interrupt, you know, my business interrupt that or have my obligations interrupt. So it's been very, very challenging and very tricky for me. Um, but I think we all just kind of do it. And, and um, uh, so it's, you know, being aware of the challenges and trying to manage them as best we can has, I, I certainly don't claim to have mastered that. I'm not sure that I ever will have, but I do my best. I, th I believe being part of being our best is working on that. Plans do change. Plans are, and I believe should be living, breathing documents, so to speak, because we might plan for what we know today, what we hope for today, but things can change tomorrow or next week or next quarter, next year. So they should constantly perpetually evolve. You, you mentioned your foundation. Could you share with us a little bit more about that, starting perhaps with the mission? Uh, thank you. So the, um, and just to add to what you just said too, the flexibility in life is key, right? I mean, we need to be flexible and the whole piece of being global um, is, has added a whole new dimension because being flexible with, um, with acceptance with other cultures and other influences that affect us case in point, you know, we, part of the, why we have this, this pandemic is because we're global. That said, we're fortunate that it's being solved globally by some of the most brilliant doctors and minds and research, uh, capabilities in the world. So it's, so being global is, you know, it's, it's been sort of a double edge, but it's, it's, uh, it's just been such a, you know, it's, it's been something to, you know, an, an added dimension to, to learn from, to grow from, and to adapt with as people and, and as a culture, right? It's so true. And as the book title states, the world is flat, but we're in another, another way of saying we're all in this together. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, and thank you for asking about my foundation. So with what I've been doing in uh, corporate America for 27 years uh, is something that I've been, thank you, um, been, uh, it, it has been a dream of mine to bring that message of respect and integrity and ethics and treating each other with respect to the masses, if you will. So I had a, um, with this dream, I approached Governor Romney, then Governor Romney, AKA the Gentleman Warrior. Yes. And I thought, who better than the Gentleman Warrior to help me launch Massachusetts Day of Civility, a day when everyone in the state, every family, every company, small, medium, and large, would perform a random act of kindness. And so whether that's offering a seat or extending a smile or offering a free cup of coffee or paying it forward on the toll, do something to extend this rent. So, um, so it's, it's all about that. I mean, the, the, the essence is that our second initiative, in fact, that day is a day uh, celebrated the Saturday before Thanksgiving. We're having our fourth annual this year. And um, we're fortunate that, um, uh, Clear Channel Outdoor has given us five, had given us five billboards scattered throughout the state, and the message is was is uh, make someone else's day, which is interesting. It's a spinoff of Clint Eastwood, Make My Day, uh, yeah. right? Yeah. So, in the whole essence is about words, the words that we choose to use, and so simply by changing two words, make someone else's day, it changes this aggressive make my day. To a, to a gesture of, of kindness and, and compassion and virtue, right? So, so that's, uh, and our second initiative was an education initiative designed to uh, educate, train, and certify teachers, faculty, and staff who serve as role models and mentors to next generation leaders who aren't getting it at home or in school for various reasons. And so uh, we hope to change all that. 
So you're driving change with all of this, what, what you're doing both with, with your business as well as your foundation. Yes, I, I'm, we're doing our very best to, to positively influence attitudes and uh, the impact that we all have on each other. So if you want to be a bully and if you want to uh, be unkind to people and, you know, that leaves a negative, but, but positive and a po positive and negative is still positive. So if you're positive and someone's negative, there's still a positive impact. And we as human beings are naturally drawn toward positive people and positive energy, right? Yes. So the subtitle of my second book, so it's my second, my first book is Don't Take the Last Donut. The second is How to Stand Apart at Work, subtitle, Transforming, Transitioning from Fine to Fabulous. So I ask everyone to become either official or unofficial members of the Fabulous Association so that regardless of how you feel, whenever anyone asks, Rick, how are you feeling? You're not going to say, you're going to say, I'm fabulous. You know, nuance. Thank you for asking. Name a person, eye contact, smile. And how are you today? And that's contagious. Yes. It is. It right? is. So true. Uh, during this morning's plan to be your best daily. These are the every weekday uh, video meetings at 11 o'clock in which we just start connecting with other professionals and people to lift and grow at the same time, especially during uh, this COVID-19 season, we'll call it. Uh, the theme for this week is positivity and having a positive attitude. And a number of people made exactly this point surrounding uh, one of the discussion questions was, who do you know in your life that is, has a, and possesses a positive attitude? What, uh, how do they impact you? So you're describing so well that, that impact. And that impact lies within each of us. So we are such an advocate that we each have the power within us. We are all empowered. And it's a matter of making that choice, choice of what words we use, the choice of how we present ourselves, how we dress today, how we, our demeanor, and how we respond to people to make a positive impact every single day. And it may sound like Pollyanna, but it really works. It's true. It works. And I see it work firsthand. You know, if you go to a, into the grocery store, even with a mask, and I love, uh, as we were chatting previously, you, you said, I do, I am smiling under this mask, yeah. Yeah. which is adorable and so true. But it's true. People look at you. They look at us and see your facial expression. And, and if you take the time to, you know, that extra two or three seconds, I know social distancing is consideration but to hold that door open for me as you see me sort of you know uh scuffling down you know shuffling the down the pavement or driveway whatever what do you see happen you know you see me picking up my gate you see me lifting up my head you see me looking at you maybe smiling and you know that you've just made a huge impact on my perhaps my entire day just by taking two or three seconds to hold the door for me and there's this wonderful magic that happens when someone does that, extends their positivity, their, their grace, their politeness, and it lifts them up. Mark Twain put it very well, said, if you want to make yourself happier, try to make someone else happy. That is so true. I've, yeah. I've read that. Yes, that's beautiful. There's that's this so echo, true. this yeah. echo effect. Exactly. Thank you. Question for you regarding your foundation. What challenges are you facing? Well, you know, <laughs> that's a loaded question. So the foundation, there are so many foundations. And of course, trying to get it funded, especially for this education initiative, has been the greatest challenge. And I've learned quickly that uh, getting funding is a, is, could be a little bit sticky. It, it's kind of political. It's sort of, uh, you know, take a number and get in line, sister, type of thing. You know what I mean? It is. And... So that's, that's our biggest challenge. And uh, so, you know, getting that education sponsorship uh, uh, initiative sponsored has been really, really difficult. Um, I've been to so many organizations and they have, you know, civility and respect and kindness um, is not really in their, um, in their, their wheelhouse of this is, is it cultural? Is it uh, technical is it so it's it's a it's a very unique niche and it has not been quite defined as yet by the major foundations 
as I have determined, as we've determined yet. So, um, however, we're hopeful and, uh, you know, it's something that, you know, we're, I'll, I'll never stop trying to, you know, get that done, especially for our education piece. Sounds so worthwhile. And for our friends who are watching, if they want to learn more about the foundation, uh, how would they find, find you on the web? Thank you. So uh, we are, it's nationalcivilityfoundation.org. We are 5013C. And uh, we have a share page. So if anyone wants to share a random act of kindness, that's great. Or donate, that would be fantastic. And we are available for, um, we launched a, a civility uh, uh, you know, speaking series. So we're available for speaking and things like that to, you know, so absolutely. Thank you for asking. Wonderful, wonderful. So you're, you're, I'm so impressed with you and all that you're doing. How, what does it mean to you to be your best? Well, no one's ever, yes, and being and, and, my best and, and, is, yes. If, if I may, pardon the interruption, just to say, um, I, I do, I surprise a lot of people with that question. And no two answers have been the same. It's such a personal um, type of question, just mm -hmm. as when we're navigating change, it's a very much of a whole person experience. And to think about what it means to be our best, the whole person fabric can be included in, in what the answer might be. Mm -hmm. so there's no such thing as a, a wrong or, or bad answer. It's going to be your answer. Oh, it's, it's, so, it's so intensely uh, personal and subjective, right? Yeah. So the, for me, uh, I would say that, that to be my best person is to be aligned with, um, you know, with my spiritual self, to have, to be well, feeling well physically, to take good care of my my body and make sure I'm eating well and resting well. I, I don't think anyone except the president can function on four hours sleep as well as, as well as the rest of us. But, um, but uh, just really, um, you know, just feeding your brain and your mind and reading and having that balance of not just your work things, but the balance of um, personal reading and maybe having a great book that's transformative that brings you to another time or uh, space or era in, in our history or um, just something you know to create that balance being in harmony and being at peace with um, my my son uh, the love of my life and the joy of my life and you know when things are askew with him my whole world is my whole orbit is, is off um, so, you know, it's just, it's really, again, Rick, it's a, it's a balance. And again, with my, my emotional, my spiritual sense, which is very important to me. So I think perhaps all of that. One, one universal dynamic that I do see play out when people describe what it means to be their best is that there is a sense of wholeness and balance. And when we're not our, at our best, something's off and we're off balance and there is not that whole wholeness uh, sense that we all cherish actually. Mm -hmm. So true. Um, you know, and to that point, to that end, I remember when I had my women's series, we launched, uh, when I had written for the uh, Boston Herald, uh, we launched a, um, a Glass Ceiling Shattered series. And I learned so much from these women CEOs, all of whom had Boston days. We started with um, with uh, Karen Polito, our lieutenant governor, we went on to our first lady, uh, and then included uh, people like Lynn Nicholas, the CEO of um, uh, Massachusetts uh, uh, Health, um, oh gosh, you know, um, <laughs> Hospital Association, I'm so sorry, and, and Houghton Mifflin, president, and on and on and on. And I was so fortunate to learn from and be able to pass on to other women and men uh, ways in which these very successful women had been able to navigate personal challenges and professional obstacles along the lines of preparation that we spoke of earlier, up to and including for, for balance to be most effective, one woman who spoke of having moved her entire family, including her uh, in-laws from the West Coast to the East Coast and help them get jobs in this area. Why? So they would be available 
as aunt, very present aunts and uncles and their children available as cousins, et cetera, to create the family unit and have that balance. And things like that's just one small example, but uh, those stories are still on my website and there's so much that we can learn. We all can learn from, from these women, amazing women. Powerful story, truly amazing. And what is your website, Judith, so that other people can find those stories as well? Thank you. So it's protocol consultants with an S dot com. Thank Sounds you. Sounds like it's a work time well spent for each of us to do that. I'll be doing that as well to look at those stories. And in fact, I'd like to get together again and have another conversation regarding uh, more of exactly that. Our, we'll have just a few minutes left for our time together today, but there's so much more to talk about with you. I do want to ask you, with if you take a look at the eight leadership strategies that are part of the plan to be your best as you navigate change framework, did any stand out to you in particular? There's the prepare, such as that you mentioned. There's accept, listen, and others. Might there be one or two that resonate with you? Uh, well, you know, the leadership strategies and steps and goals. So to me, th thank you for that question. And our message has always been about confidence. And uh, so if you're confident in knowing, so there are rules and boundaries. So the word etiquette is actually a French word having to do with boundaries, at a cat. It refers to lines and stanchions that King Louis XIV uh, had drawn at Versailles to keep the aristocrats from trampling his garden. And so I believe once people, because we're all kind of unsure, you know, these, especially our younger generations are kind of thrust out into the world and different people offer programs and this advice and watch this video. That if, you know, I believe that once we are confident in navigating the business and social landscape so that we're, we know that everything we're doing and saying is, is within the, the acceptable boundaries, if you will, and there are always boundaries, whether they're spoken or unspoken, we're then confident to uh, to focus on people and relationships, which is what the world evolves around at hand. So, uh, so to me, uh, you know, uh, the various tenets of leadership and all that are so important, but to me, it's an inner uh, strength. It's an inner confidence that you project and whether or not you're really feeling it that day, um, you know, which not all of us are 100% every day, that's for sure. However, uh, projecting it in a way that others believe that it's there is huge. It's an art, and that's where we spoon feed specific nuances to make that seem automatic, become, excuse me, automatic, not seem automatic, and become the person, you know, that person that you are. So, be because perception is reality. So, I would say confidence is the underlying theme of leadership. That's, that's such a wonderful addition to one way to describe how we can be our best to have work on that confidence and to, to own that. That's wonderful. Thank you, thank you. I'm just so, so impressed, as I said earlier, with everything that you're doing. We're going to have another conversation, Judith, and uh, have, we've got more to talk about, and to have other people have this chance to listen to all the, the goodness, the intelligence, the insight that, that you're providing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rick. What a pleasure. Thank you. So we will be talking again to all those of you who have been watching. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank, Thank you. you so Be well. Stay well and healthy you, and you safe. Thank you. Take care. God bless.